Well, very uh, <coughs> warm welcome <coughs> to the second Oakley Tyndall lecture for this academic year. Um, we've already heard my colleague Ashutosh Varshni uh, eloquently introduce our distinguished speaker, William Dalrymple, this Tuesday. And uh, allow me to revisit this biography very briefly for those who are unable to join us then, and also because it is such a remarkable biography. So William Dalrymple was educated at Trinity College, Cambridge, and began work on his first book whilst still in college. That book in Zanadu, published when Dalrymple was but 22 years old, modeled on Marco Polo's 13th century travelogue in medieval China, described a journey across the width of Asia and inaugurated a prolific and highly creative life in letters and on the road. Dalrymple's numerous publications since include Delhi City of Jinns, 1993, From the Holy Mountain, 1997, White Mughals, 2002, and The Last Mughal, 2006. For these, he's won numerous awards and honors, including the Thomas Cook Travel Book Award, the Duff Cooper pa Prize, the, the Prix d'Astrolabe in 2005, the Penn History Award, the Kiriyama Prize, the James State Black Memorial Prize, and the Vodafone Crossword Award for nonfiction, amongst numerous others. William Dalrymple is Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the Royal Geographical Society, and of the Royal Asiatic Society, and a founder and co-director of the renowned Jaipur Literary Festival. He has three honorary doctorates of letters from the University of St. Andrews, Lucknow University, and from the University of Aberdeen, and several more are on their way. He's a regular contributor to The New Yorker, The Guardian, The TLS, and The New York Review of Books, and the India correspondent of The New Statesman and an award-winning broadcaster. Now, South Asia looms large in, in Dalrymple's creative uh, uh, output, as indeed East Asia once did for Marco Polo. Much like his uh, itinerant predecessor, uh, Dalrymple too engages his subject with intense self-involvement and self-awareness as a collaborator, an interlocutor, an ambassador, and an ally. And perhaps his greatest contribution is the love and insight with which he conveys especially the complex and profound cultures of South Asian Islam, bearing witness to its heterodox forms of faith and power, Sufism, magic, music, and the vanishing world of Bahadur Shah Zafar II, mystic, poet, calligrapher, and the last Mughal emperor of India. The theme of tenuous power occupies his most recent book, Return of a King, Battle for Afghanistan, 2013. A, a remarkable rendition of the first Anglo-Afghan war and a tale of colonial ambition and cultural collision for our own militaristic times. In the spring of 1839, the British invaded Afghanistan for the first time and re-established on the throne the puppet king Shah Shuja ul mulk Within two years, the Afghans rose in answer to the call for jihad, and Afghanistan exploded into rebellion. It's no small irony that Shah Shuja and President Hamid Karzai share the same small tribal heritage. The Shah's principal opponents were the Gilzai tribe, which today make up the bulk of the Taliban's foot soldiers. What are the burdens of this history? How does NATO compare to the colonial army of the first Anglo-Afghan war? 
and how might we avert the imperial disasters of the 19th century? And indeed, what were those disasters? William Dalrymple draws on this remarkable study to address us today on the repetitions of history to which we are heir. I will introduce our discussant, Fez Ahmed, after, Professor, after, after William Dalrymple's talk. For now, please join me in, in welcoming um, William Dalrymple to the second. Thank you. Thank you. What I, I'll be, can you hear? What I propose doing um, is for the next hour just to tell you a story. Uh, and we can save the analysis um, for, the, for the, the hour with Fez. And we'll um, talk about parallels, uh, and the many parallels then. But the story of the first Afghan war is so extraordinary that um, for the next hour, I think I'll just give you some narrative. So I'd love you to imagine yourselves away from the cherry blossom of uh, Rhode Island uh, and to transport yourselves back. I won't take a huge amount of imagination to imagine bleak step and uh, blowing, uh, blowing ice and snow. Uh, think back uh, a few weeks. Um, and <laughs> imagine yourselves for a minute on the open step on a bleak November night in 1837. And we are between Meshed in northeast Iran and Herat in western Afghanistan. And a war is about to break out. The new um, Qajar Shah of Iran, Mohammed II Qajar, has announced in his coronation speech shortly a month before that he wants to retake for Persia the disputed border fortress of Herat, traditionally in the eyes of, uh, uh, of Persians, a major center of Persianate culture. And within weeks of him coming to the throne, uh, Muhammad II, <laughs> who's the, the son of the fabulous uh, Fatih Ali Shah Qajar, the guy with the enormous long beard in every book on Qajar art. Uh, Muhammad II has a slightly disappointing beard and uh, rather less good kit than his father, but uh, uh, he, more effective, he hoped, on the battlefield. So within weeks of coming to the throne, uh, Muhammad II is marching his armies up the military road from Tehran to the border at Meshed. And for weeks, infantry regiments have been tramping up this road, horse cavalry, some under uh, Russian officership have been heading uh, the same direction, post horses zipping back and forwards between the two. Uh, but now, in November, days before the war is about to break out, an invasion is about to begin, in the cold of this night, the road is now empty. Uh, the, uh, the, so the infantry are tucked into their barracks and into their tents. And just as you're standing there on this bleak step in this November night, a single horseman comes up the road um, towards you. And this is, uh, as you go as closer, you can see, uh, is a 21-year-old East India Company officer by the name of Henry Rawlinson. And of course, like all good filmic beginnings, he is, of course, a secret intelligence officer. Uh, this, this story has got all those bits of bobs on it. And uh, Rawlinson, um, you, as he draws close, you can see, is shattered. He's exhausted. He's been on this horse uh, for uh, two nights and two days. Uh, he's been trying to get from the far west of Iran, in Tabriz, to Meshed before uh, the war breaks out. And so he's barely slept because the war is, uh, is uh, about to break out. The normal system of post horses and the caravanserais is not working properly. He hasn't been able to change his mount, so the horse is exhausted, he's exhausted. Uh, and at some point, at about 11 o'clock at night, he's so exhausted, he actually falls asleep in the saddle. Now, I haven't ridden since I was a teenager, and I, I can't remember or don't know how long you could actually stay on the saddle when you're asleep, uh, leaning forward um, with boots on uh, your feet and stirrups. But uh, certainly, it's long enough for him 
to, for the horse to wander off the road. And he disappears off. And by the time he wakes up, presumably about to sort of fall off the thing uh, and, and comes to, he realizes that he's completely lost. And it's a moonless night. And this, even at the best of times, the Iran-Afghan border is not the kind of place you particularly want to get lost. It's the route today where all the heroin heading for Rhode Island and other dodgy parts uh, um, will we'll be heading uh, westwards. It's, uh, it's what we in Scotland call debatable land, uh, claimed by uh, different parties. And uh, it's, it, even today, even in the middle of the day, it's not a kind of place for wandering around on your own. But it, uh, on, on the eve of a war, in 1837, it's emphatically not the place you want to get lost. So he's very nervous, and he's trying to regain the road, and only manages to get more lost. And so he's very relieved five or six hours later, beginning to panic, when dawn begins to show itself on the tops of the Kohi Shah Jahan mountains. And you can just see the first, maybe the first pink of dawn. And this allows him, of course, to work out where east is, where west is, to reorientate himself. And he turns his horse around, and he heads back w down what becomes clear is a kind of low valley, a dry valley. And he's heading back to the main military road, where he imagines the road is. And after an hour or so, he, he, he imagines he must be close to regaining that road when he sees what he least wants to see. Coming up the road towards him, across the width of the valley, cutting him off from the road he's trying to regain, is a party of armed horsemen a large party, coming directly for him. So he does what any of us would do in that situation, is he makes himself scarce. He gets off the horse, he uh, goes to the edge of the valley, finds a rock, an overhang of rock or a tree or something to tie up the horse, and he hunkers down on his belly to watch what it is coming towards him. And as it draws closer, he sees it. And what it is changes, in a very real way, the history of Afghanistan, Iran and South Asia for the next hundred years. It's a really crucial moment because what he sees, and I'm, I think we're jumping ahead of things. So we, hang on, I'm not going to tell you quite what he sees. No, no, yeah, no, yeah. No, <laughs> I'll just make you wait. This is a story. This is a story. <laughs> Storytellers are allowed to do this. Um, so what he sees, um, where are we? 1837. This is 22 years after Waterloo. And the French at Waterloo have been knocked out of the, um, the Imperial World Cup, the IPL. I don't know what the baseball equivalent is. What's the, uh, uh, the league for... I mean, forget baseball analogies for a second. <laughs> There's enough South Asians in the room to cope with cricket. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so there's just two left for the finalists, if you like, uh, Russia and Britain. But as we discussed last week, not the British government in India, it is this sinister multinational. It is, uh, uh, it is the East India Company. And between 1765, 1765, where we were talking about last week on Friday, where it was, Monday? I totally lost track of time Tuesday. now. Tuesday. Uh, from, uh, from 1765, where we were on Tuesday, to now 1837, uh, in that time, the company has conquered all of South Asia up to the Sutledge River. Uh, and this multinational has subdued or defeated or created a treaty alliance with every power from, from the south of the peninsula right up through central India, through what was the big Maratha lands in the center, up through what had been the Mughal capital of Delhi, uh, up into the Sutlej River, on, within sight of the Himalayan peaks, is all now East India Company. Uh, and this has been the most terrific advance. Wellesley conquered more of India than Napoleon conquered of Europe. And this took place in as little as five years, this extraordinary conquest between uh, 1801 and 1805. Um, and at the same time as this is going on in India, using the same new 18th century technology in horse artillery, fast-moving uh, cannon were the kind of equivalent what the tank was in the Second World War, horse artillery was in the 1820s and 30s, the Russians using modern ballistics and modern explosive shells, using exactly the same technology on similar Asian cavalry armies, have been moving south since the time of Peter the Great at a rate of about 100 miles every decade. Uh, and they, by 1837, they have reached what's called the Orenburg Line, uh, which is just north of all those lovely 
silk route cities that people visit on tours, Bukhara, Samarkand, Kiva, uh, all those will be swallowed up in the next decade or two by the Russians. But the Russians are just north of that now. But any old buffer sitting in a gentleman's club in Pall Mall in London or an officer's mess in St. Petersburg can see that these two forces are heading towards each other at speed, that both that the uh, imperial blot, if you like, uh, is spreading uh, on, the, uh, on the map, and that the land between the two is shrinking year by year, decade by decade, at speed. However, there is still a considerable amount of land between them. There is still the whole of the modern stans, modern Afghanistan, and modern Pakistan, which is almost exactly taken up by the Sikh empire of Ranjit Singh, which is the last major uh, South Asian power to resist the company, uh, and has a very considerable and very effective army officered by ex-Napoleonic generals. Um, so there's all this blocking the two. And for that reason, it's very difficult to persuade uh, the authorities, the military authorities, either in St. Petersburg or Calcutta and London, that, it's, that, that there is any real threat from either the other, because there's simply so much land between them. Which is why what our friend Rawlinson sees that morning matters. Because what he sees is not drug smugglers, it's not Dakus, it's not the Russia, uh, it's not the uh, Afghans going to invade the Persians, or the Persians going to invade the Afghans. It is a party to his great excitement. And no doubt he realizes this is a kind of career changing moment. What he sees coming towards him is a troop of Russian Imperial Cossack cavalry in Russian uniform carrying the Russian flag, heading for the Russian border. Now, if you're uh, an intelligence officer in 1837, this is your weapons of mass destruction. This is your moment uh, when you, you, watch, you, you have what appears to be the unequivocal and unambiguous evidence of exactly the threat that all the hawks have been talking up, but without any evidence for up to this point. Here we have, he sees him, so with his own eyes, this site. So, of course, he rushes back to Tehran on this poor horse. Um, camel runners cross down to Hormuz. Steamers cross to, uh, uh, to Suez. Um, Post-haste runners rush across Sinai to Alexandria. Another steamer passes to Marseille, which is, uh, to Marseille, which is as far as the telegraph has got in 1837. And Morse code is being beeped out. And at some point, some character presumably walks up the streets, uh, the steps of Dowding Street or into the Foreign Office and says the Russians have gone into Afghanistan. And this puts the Imperial War Machine into fifth gear. So that within two years of that sighting, the largest army that the East India Company has put into the field since Tipu Sultan is ready in Ferozpur, about to cross the Sutlej, and leapfrog, the plan is, over the Sikh Empire uh, and to invade the lands beyond. Um, and the East India Company is lucky because it has in its back pocket, so to speak, a very useful asset. Um, this character, who is not Gimli from Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, although he looks <laughs> extremely like he might be the model for him, uh, this is Shah Shuja ul Mulk. Um, who uh, is the slightly disappointing grandson of Ahmed Shah Abdali. Ahmed Shah Abdali is this fantastic sort of central <laughs> casting, Central Asian warlord in sort of knee-high boots. Um, to add to the kind of special effects, uh, Ahmed Shah Abdali has some horrible growth on one side of his <laughs> face, which has eaten up the left-hand side, and he's coated it in silver studded with jewels. Um, uh, and... Uh, with this sort of fantastic outfit, the sort of Darth Vader of 19th century uh, uh, Afghanistan, Amish Shadurani creates the first Afghan empire, conquers almost all of Afghanistan, a lot of Persia, Kashmir, as far as Lahore. A major figure. But poor old uh, Shah Shuja, the grandson, as is so often the case in dynasties in this part of the world, uh, uh, as we know to our cost in India, uh, the grandson rather less impressive than the son, the son rather less impressive than the grandson, the grandson a total disappointment. Uh, and uh, he's been on a bit of a sabbatical lately, El <laughs> Shah uh, He's been, uh, he's walked out from, um, uh, he's been kicked out of Kabul. He, uh, his, uh, his, uh, this character, Emir Dost Mohammed, the middle in the middle, as drawn by Emily Eden, the Viceroy's sister, um, 
has, repl has now taken over all the old Sadazai lands. Poor El Shashuja passing through Lahore is gulled of his last remaining treasure, which is the Kohinoor diamond. Uh, and he arrives penniless at the East India Company uh, border at Ludhiana, where Sir David Octoloni, uh, one of my favorite white moguls, he of 13 elephants, each with his own Indian wife on, the, on, on top of each one, takes him in, realizing that this is a character who can be useful in the future. And for 30 years, the company gives him a generous pe pension, puts him up in a nice big haveli in Ludhiana, waiting for the time when he can be pulled out and used. And that moment comes in 1837 when, um, hang on, uh, this man, this is Vitkovich, the, uh, the Russian uh, who leads this expedition uh, over the border. But, of course, like all good intelligence stories uh, involving British intelligence, British intelligence gets it completely wrong. Uh, and this is not a Russian invasion of Afghanistan at all, even though this has now been cranked up unequivocally to be such uh, in, the, in the hawkish uh, pro-war literature and arguments. What it is, in fact, is a very tentative, unofficial uh, probing mission uh, by Vitkovich, who is an extraordinary story in himself. He's a sort of Tolstoyan character. He was originally a Polish, born in Tbilisi, uh, a, a Polish nobleman who resisted uh, uh, was leading anti-Tsarist um, rebellion at his school, age 15, when he got caught sort of more or less putting anti-Tsarist anti slogans on the blackboard. And he and his friends get literally get uh, sentenced to life exile on the steppe. He's stripped of his nobility, he's stripped of his lands, and sent off. All his friends commit suicide in the first three years. Vitkovich basically goes over to the dark side and uh, learns... Um, all uh, the languages of the steppe becomes fluent in Kazakh, Turki, uh, Farsi, and becomes the leading Russian um, uh, intelligence officer in that part of the world. And it's on, and he pushes for his own self-advancement this expedition. Uh, and they've gone in disguise through the Caucasus, entered Persia, and they've only just got into the Russian uniform an hour or two earlier when they've left the military road confident that no one will see them, not realizing. And this pure chance of this young man getting lost and actually seeing them provokes, or this chance circumstance provokes all that happens. So um, by, uh, here we are. This is the army in Ferris. There, there, uh, there are, there is some resistance. This young man is Vitkovich's British counterpart, Alexander Burns. Um, an over-promoted, some would say over-sexed Scott, uh, who has irritated all his uh, seniors by um, going to Afghanistan, publishing books, getting an audience with the king, uh, all this sort of thing. As a result, all his superior officers hate his guts. Uh, he's got the gold medal of both the British and the French Royal Geographical Society, and so on and so forth. And everyone ignores his reports, particularly this his rival, a much elder man called Wade, who's basically uh, in charge of the frontier. And uh, Burns says there's absolutely no reason to go into Afghanistan. The um, Emir Dos Mohammed wants to make peace with us. He's free. He's very happy to get rid of the Russians. We just have to ask. There's no need to go to war at all. But he's ignored, largely due to interpartmental jealousies. And so by 1837, um, Ranjit Singh has announced that he will not allow the army to pass through his lands, realizing quite rightly that once the East India Company is to the north of him and to the south of him, it's only a matter of time before the Punjab is uh, 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 squeezed into uh, the East India Company embrace. Uh, but the un undaunted, the company decides to go round Ranjit Singh and to enter Afghanistan through Sindh and up the Bolan Pass. And in 1839, this enormous army is assembled uh, in the plains of Ferozpur. It has 14,000 East India Company sepoys, 6,000 Rohilla irregulars who are supposed to be Shah Shuja's Afghans, but most have been in India 200 years and uh, have no relationship with Afghanistan. 21,000 troops in all, accompanied by 38,000 Indian camp followers, all these characters in the background here putting up tents or loading camels with mess plates and munchies in their wagons, the treasure on the bullock carts, men 
uh, uh, carrying sheep, uh, people who caught pilfering supplies being uh, moved forward in chains. Um, 38,000 Indian camp followers, 30,000 camels. One brigadier needs at least 50 camels to carry all his kit, including his bath. The leading uh, British general needs 260 camels to carry all his changes of mess kit and clothes and so on. Um, one regiment goes into Afghanistan with its own pack of foxhounds. Um, uh, the, uh, there are 300 camels carrying uh, uh, Madeira and Claret. Um, there are uh, 30 camels carrying cheroots and cigars for the officers. And there's one camel that goes all the way to Central Asia carrying nothing but eau de cologne. Uh, the one thing they forget to bring is a map, because they haven't got one. Uh, and so they go off uh, on this crazy expedition with all these sepoys dressed up in winter uniform, because they're, of course, going to Afghanistan. It's going to be cold. But because Ranjit Singh's closed the road, what should have been a three-week march from Ludhiana up to Peshawar has now become a six-month detour via Quetta and the Baluchistan Desert. Uh, they're in winter uniforms. It's now May. Uh, and so these poor guys are trooping through Baluchistan at the height of the Baluchi summer, no idea where the water is, uh, and of course they're dropping like flies. Without a single piece of opposition, uh, this force is falling apart. This now, anyone that's been on the railway from Quetta to Lahore would have passed through this. This is where the, the railway goes um, uh, in the Bolan Pass. But in those days, uh, the kind of back door to Afghanistan uh, with unmetalled roads, un well, anything roads. I mean, very, 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 very tricky communications. And even with uh, this, this is a very familiar sight uh, to anyone uh, who's ever travelled in South Asia at all. Um, lost uh, sepoys sitting on a road, asking the locals uh, wh which way to Afghanistan, well, and they say, "Go straight, sir. See you, Jay. No yeah. problem." <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> And the result is, uh, if we could get a pointer, was it a pointer? Um, no, we haven't got a pointer. Anyway, you can see the kind of streams of, 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 of uh, it, like ants out of an ant hill, these poor sepoys heading off in every conceivable direction, probably except Afghanistan, um, lost in this territory. And it's, it's a kind of fantastically ill-managed campaign. Uh, nothing, there's no, no advanced force sent ahead to kind of open up, uh, you know, uh, rock slides or find the wells. and, and uh, there is an incredible death rate, something like one in five sepoys just die through dehydration and starvation and heat stroke. Uh, so it's a complete mess. But through sheer, uh, and, and there is occasional plundering parties of Baluchis uh, shooting down from caves and so on, but uh, it's largely the company's own incompetence. But just the sheer momentum of this attack is such that in due course they debouch into the dash, the meadow south of Kandahar, and arrive at Kandahar. Um, oops, I've done the wrong thing here. Could someone rescue the? Uh, do we have a techie here that can put it back on? I'm pressing the wrong button. Any friend? Have you been able to operate your? I'm not a techie, but I know how to operate. If you can operate your, if you can operate your Windows as well as you danced last night. There we go. <laughs> um, so. Here we are in Kandahar, and such is the surprise that this enormous army has appeared to the south of Kandahar um, that the, uh, the um, Baraksai um, uh, uh, leaders in, in Kandahar flee over the border to Iran, and Shah Shuja can reclaim it for the Sadazai. He walks into town uh, to the mausoleum of his grandfather, Ahmed Shah Durrani, in the top left of the picture, modelled on Satyajang's tomb in Delhi. Um, and uh, he, pay, he pays respects to his grandfather and without a shot being found. And then again, yet again, British intelligence intervenes, and as we know again, the British government never gets anything wrong, uh, as in the James Bond films. Uh, and uh, that some chap turns up and says, it's okay, uh, you can leave the artillery behind because there's no more, uh, there's no more fortifications between here and Kabul. So, and these guys have been pulling these enormous... Um, heavy artillery siege pieces all the way up the Bolan Pass. They've had to <coughs> take the barrels off and strap them to camels and the, other, it, the hind parts to another camel and all this stuff heaving up the mountains, just like that opening scene in Aguirre uh, when, uh, when uh, Klaus Kinski is climbing Machu Picchu with all his conquests and all that, and the cannons, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So um, 
they leave it all behind, and they march on towards Ghazni, only to find that Ghazni does, in fact, have rather good fortifications. It is, in fact, the, the largest fortress in Central Asia. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, so, so blushing faces and intelligence departments. But what do they do? They can't leave this fortress. Uh, Dost Mohammed has been fortifying it for exactly this eventuality for six months. It's full of supplies, full of artillery. The walls are in good repair. So luckily some gallant chap volunteers to roll the barrel of gunpowder at the front gate and they take it in 24 hours. From arriving at 9 in the morning, uh, 12 hours, they take it by 9 at night. And such is the shock of this taking of Ghazni without artillery that Dost Muhammad gives up the ghost at this point, and he flees off over the Hindu Kush to Bukhara, where he's imprisoned by the Emir of Bukhara and thrown into the famous pit in Bukhara. Uh, later, was where uh, Connolly, the man who first put down the words great game together, uh, where he ended up. Um, and Shah Shuja can walk into the Bala Hissar of Kabul and is reinstalled on his throne that he left 30 years. He's now 51. He was 21 when he left or was kicked out. And for all intents and purposes, this looks like the most tremendous triumph. And as in 2001 uh, or 2002, there's a lot of sort of uh, a hawkish, uh, laughter about um, uh, about uh, 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 what is it uh, surrender French surrender monkeys or whatever all that sort of stuff gets relayed um, that Afghanistan has been conquered with minimum uh, casualties on the map it looks fabulous you control the route from Persia to China from India to Central Asia it's a major strategic asset the Russians have been ousted there were never any Russians but they've been ousted uh, and. Uh, uh, Shah Shuja, our man, is back on the throne. This, of course, is a classic case of what we today call uh, regime change. And uh, uh, as Lina said, Shah Shuja is the chief of the Popul Zai. The chief of the Popul Zai today is a man called Hamid Karzai. So it's, it, it's, this is a direct uh, precursor in many ways to what's happened more recently. And in the smugness of this extraordinary turn of events are sown the seeds of everything which will go wrong. The British behave as if they're sitting outside Chennai or uh, Calcutta. They just build a cantonment. They don't fortify themselves in some mountain fastness. They just line up their tents in the valley outside Kabul. Uh, and even the incredibly dim Scottish uh, 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 chaplain of the army, as the Reverend Gleig points out in his memoirs, this is, this is no a very defensible site, uh, and indeed it isn't, as you can see from this, uh, as you can see from this uh, picture, uh, you can roll stones down on this cantonment from every single side, it's a completely indefensible site, uh, with, there are millions of defensible sites on all sides of it, but it is not defensible, um, and, uh, but none abashed, uh, the, um, the occupation begins. Lady Sale leads the Memsabs up from, uh, from uh, Agra, and she brings all her kit. She comes with her seeds from her kitchen garden in Canal, a grand piano. Um, how she gets the grand piano is not recorded up her, but so presumably no easy thing to transport either way you take it. Uh, and her unmarried daughter, Alexandrina, who promptly... Um, has half the men in the cantonment falling in love with her. Next year, Lady Sales writing in her diary, my sweet peas and geraniums were much admired by the Afghan gentlemen, uh, and in the kitchen garden, the potatoes especially thrive. There is cricket and horse racing and open-air amateur theatricals, and as the winter draws in, snipe and duck shooting, skating and snowman building. The foxhounds, which one regiment brought, are taken out to hunt jackals. Uh, Alexander Burns, who has withdrawn his reservations about the, uh, about the expedition, uh, having been granted a baronetcy, an early case of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 honours being used to silence opposition, um, uh, throws a Christmas party with Scottish reels and bagpipes, and he presides over it all in Highland dress, complete with a kilt and an enormous sporran. Um, Shah Shuja brings his family up from Ludhiana, uh, and Dost Mohammed escapes from the pit in Bukhara and surrenders 
himself to Henry McNaughton in the top hat and the big glasses, yeah? Um, but points out in his surrender, he says, Sir, here is my sword, I surrender to you, but why have you come? He said, <laughs> this, is, this is a land of only stones and men. And this penny begins to drop at this point, uh, that uh, there is nothing for the East India Company to exploit in Afghanistan. You've gone to the Punjab, you can tax the farmers, you can tax the merchants, you can run off with a koh noor you can do all sorts of jolly things, the sort of things imperialists like to do. Uh, you can plunder, but you, there is nothing, really, to plunder in Afghanistan. There is no profit to be made. You can tax a few caravans, but that's about it. On the other hand, the costs of the occupation are enormous, because you have to install uh, uh, troops at every valley, the fortifications at every point, and particularly, you have to bribe the tribes. Uh, everyone who's ever conquered or controlled Afghanistan from the Mughals through Nadia Shah to Amir Shah Durrani pays the Afridis and the Gilzai Radari road tax, which is sort of Don Corleone style protection money. If you pay them, the roads are open. If you don't, you never get anything through. And the British have offered all these guys large sums of money. And within a year of the occupation, the company accountants in Calcutta realize that this has seriously put the narrow profits of India heavily into the red. And the company has no pretenses about a civilizing mission or anything. It's just there for profit. It's a company. Uh, and so, of course, they have to do, um, they have to cut back. Uh, and this, at the same time as this realization dawns that, the, uh, that this is an enormously expensive occupation that's producing no tax revenue uh, and nothing to, uh, to underwrite itself, in a, uh, a turn of events that couldn't possibly happen today, they go off and take their eye off the ball and invade somewhere else. Uh, in this case, not Iraq, but Hong Kong. This is our most moral war, the, the Opium War uh, of 1841, uh, when the British uh, attack the Summer Palace in Peking and seize Hong Kong for the right to sell narcotics to the Chinese, this honorable principle. Um, and uh, the, so the garrisons are reduced to a skeleton garrison. And only a few... Uh, remain, uh, only about, uh, I think, it's down to about uh, uh, 10,000 company sepoys left in Afghanistan. And uh, then they realize they're still not in profit. So they have to cut down the uh, subsidies promised to the Gilzais and the Afridis. And this is the fatal mistake. They've been promised, I think, 10 lakh per year to every tribal chieftain on the road. And they come back and say, sorry, chaps, we're just going to give you one lakh. And all the old gentlemen leave the, 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 uh, the conference in Kabul, stroking their beards, saying, yes, sir. The next morning, all the post boys are found with their necks slit. Not a letter, not a grain of dal passes up the Tiber Pass. Uh, not a single communication reaches Kabul from the border. Uh, and more particularly, the... Um, the outlying garrisons in Jalalabad and Kandahar are completely cut off. Uh, and at this point, this is the point that Alexander Burns, our, our oversex Scotsman, decides to seduce the girlfriend of one of Shah Shuja's leading generals. Now, this is one of the. This is not a wise thing to do. Uh, <laughs> an important lesson, gentlemen, for any of you heading to Afghanistan is keep yourself well zipped up. Um, because uh, Burns doesn't, and soon comes to regret his transgressions. According to the Afghan Franklin Mir Mirza Atta, a slave girl of Abdullah Khan Achaksai ran away from his house to the residence of Alexander Burns. When on inquiry it was found that that was where she had, got, had gone, the Khan, beside himself with fury, sent his attendant to fetch the silly girl back. But the Scotsman, swollen with pride, cursing and swearing, had the Khan's attendant severely beaten and thrown out the house. The Khan then summoned the other Sadars and said, the, 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 the Afghan chiefs, and said, now we are justified in throwing off the British yoke. They stretched the hand of tyranny and dishonor private citizens, great and small. Making love to a slave girl isn't worth the ritual bath that follows it. But we have to put a stop right here, right now. Another, Otherwise, and gentlemen, please, this is the, the lesson I'd like you to take home tonight. Otherwise, these English will ride the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. 
In Afghanistan, you have to keep your donkey of desire well tethered up in the stable of chastity. Um, but Alexander Burns does not learn this lesson. Uh, his donkey is untethered, and uh, the result is that the Sadars attack Burns' house, kill his sepoy guard, play football with his head for a bit, and then hang up his trunk of his body on a meat hook in the bazaar. And within a week, all hell has broken loose. Um, the leading British general, General Elphinstone, who's a scout-ridden old fool who hasn't seen action since Waterloo, gets onto his horse, he falls off the horse, the horse falls on him, and that's the end of Elphinstone. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sir Henry McNaughton, uh, in his top hat and pink, Tinted glasses, which is a nice touch. He, he had, uh, I'm not sure you can see it on the slide, but he had pink tinted glasses. Um, goes out to negotiate, meets the negotiating team, the negotiating team shoots him dead. Uh, end of McNaughton. Um, the British have very uh, cleverly put all their supplies of gunpowder and food in two outlying forts next to the old city and at some distance from the cantonment. So the Afghans pour out of the city, capture all the food, capture all the guns, capture all the gunpowder, and then, as you can see in this slide, pull all the, the, the British artillery up onto the hill above the cantonment and just start shelling the cantonment with the British artillery. And as you can see in this picture, it's still basically tents in the valley. Uh, completely indefensible. There's a few barrack blocks that come up. These rather nice things, nice Georgian barrack blocks, but basically tents. There's one little bit of walling down here, but it's more or less completely open, and this is not going to play. Um, they are surrounded on all sides, they're cut off, and as they say in Game of Thrones, winter is coming. <laughs> um, this, there is snow billowing in from the Hindu Kush. It's a foot deep already by October. By the <coughs> six weeks of siege later, uh, it's five feet high. It's, uh, it's uh, again... Uh, nothing that you haven't seen here in uh, uh, in uh, 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 Boston or Rhode Island, but it's a uh, it's a bitter, bitter winter, the worst for thirty years, and there's nothing to eat, uh, and there's no supplies coming. There's definitely going to be no rescue party coming till the next summer because the passes are blocked, and so uh, there is an extended negotiations. But in the end, the court agrees that these guys can leave with all their regimental colours, which is something they obsess about in negotiations for about three weeks, uh, uh, waiting uh, each day, of course, counting to whether the, they can ever actually get out of this, uh, the country. Uh, but they negotiate for three weeks about their regimental colours. Eventually, they're allowed to take the set of colours out with them uh, and, all their and all their small weapons, but not their artillery. And finally, when it's unclear whether it's going to be possible to go anywhere at all, on the 6th of January, 1842, the retreat from Kabul begins. By this stage, there's only 4,500 troops left. Most of them are Biharis who've never seen snow before. Only 700 of them uh, are, uh, are regular British Army. The rest are company sepoys. And they're outnumbered by 12,000 camp followers who are coming to them. Women, children... Sices, Malis, Kitnagars, all that whole paraphernalia of imperial rule. And in the lead is my great uncle, this handsome chap, um, Colin Mackenzie. And he, one of the few survivors, writes in his diary that at 9 a.m. on the 6th of January, the troops moved off. A crouching, drooping, dispirited army so different from the smart, light-hearted body of men they appeared some time ago, the men sinking a foot deep in the snow with each step. My heart sunk within me under the conviction that we were a doomed force. I always remember as one of the most heart-rending sights of that humiliating day, fixing my eyes by chance on a little Hindustani child sitting perfectly naked in the snow with no mother or father near her. She was a beautiful little child, about two years old, just strong enough to sit upright with her little legs doubled underneath her, hair curling in waving locks around her soft little throat, and her great black eyes, dilated to twice their normal size, fixed on the armed men, the passing cavalry, and the strange sights that met her gaze. 
Many other children, as young as innocents, I saw slain on the road. And women with their long, dark hair, wet with their own blood. The rear guards had to bike the whole way to Bagrami and pass through a literally continuous line of poor wretches, men, women and children, <coughs> dead or dying from cold and wounds, who, unable to move, entreated their comrades to kill them and put an end to their misery. So these guys, in the early part of this uprising, lost all their commissariat. They lost all their uh, uh, guns, artillery, food. They do the same thing again on the retreat. They out first come the cavalry, followed by the infantry and the, and the camp followers carrying all the baggage come last. The Afghans just pour out of Kabul, seize all the tents, seize all the food, seize all the, uh, the ammunition. And so by tea time, the officers of the cavalry arriving at the camping site, where's my bearer, where's my bath, where's my tent? No bath, no bearer, no tent, no Madeira, no cheroot, no eau de cologne. Uh, nothing, because it's all gone. And by this stage, come sunset, six o'clock, the whole of the night sky is bathed red with the burning contumelants. All those uh, wooden barrack blocks we saw in that picture are all now up in flames, illuminating the sky. And the temperature's gone down to minus 10. By 10 o'clock, it's minus 20. Uh, and most of these guys are Biharis from Lucknow. They've never seen snow before. They don't know what to do in snow. They're wearing shorts. Um, and they lie down in the snow, and many of them do not get up the following morning. Mackenzie is leading the Jezilchis, the Afghan mercenaries fighting for the British, and they know what to do. They have trowels that they carry, and they have little bags of millet that they bring with them in case of emergencies. They make their millet, uh, they eat. On the, they lie down around the fire. They've excavated a little foxhole in the snow, and they lie down body to body like... Uh, uh, numbers in a clock, I suppose, or petals on a flower, uh, uh, with their feet facing the fire, and they cover themselves with their cloaks and their turbans and any textiles they have, uh, and they use their body heat to keep them alive during the night. But the following morning, when the Hindustanis wake up, they, any that are alive, and many of them aren't, wake up to find their hands black. It's been to minus 30 in the night. Uh, and they're totally frostbitten. Their feet are black, their toes are black, their hands are black, they can't get up. Most of them are crawling around. They certainly can't operate a musket. And at that point, Wazir Akbar Khan um, leads them. Hang on, I'm getting wrong. Here we are. Wazir Akbar Khan appears and just drives them like a shepherd into the Kozkabul Pass, where uh, the Gilzais have been digging trenches for the previous three weeks of, of foot dra dragging negotiations. And three miles down the Kozkabul Pass, uh, the hillsides explode. They hear, first of all, this eerie echoing noise, which they can't place echoing through the mountains. And it's the Sai and it's the Gisales being primed for firing, that the, the, the uh, um, uh, the rods going down to pack the gunpowder. They have these huge ex explosive charges in Gisales. They take long to load, but they have arranged three times the company muskets. So they've put their trenches just high enough for them to be able to shoot the British at the foot of the mountain, but the British can't fight back. Which is why in 1857, the Enfield rifles are sent in, because these are guns have proved so inadequate to the grief cut to the, the next round, but that's a different story. So Lady Sale, who's burnt her grand piano for firewood the night before, is in the front. The confusion was fearful. We had not proceeded half a mile when we were heavily fired upon. The pony Mrs. Sturt Road was wounded in the ear and the neck. I fortunately had only one musket ball in my arm. Isn't that a wonderful sentence? Yeah. You've just been shot. You don't say I've been shot, I'm bleeding, I'm in the middle of the Cold War Pass. I fortunately had only one musket ball in my arm. Oh. Three others passed through my cloak near the shoulder without doing me any injury. The pass completely choked up, and for a considerable period we were stationary under heavy fire. The sepoys and camp followers, half frozen, tried to force their way not only into our tents, but into our beds. Many poor wretches died around the tent in the night, Many women and children were abducted. So the first night, there's 18 and a half thousand men, women, and children leave the cantonment. Of those, about 3,000 don't wake up that first morning, and it's down to 15,000. By the time they've passed through the Kulkabul ambush, it's down to about 12,000. At that point, they then climb up the Tezin Pass, which is the highest point, and land in the most enormous blizzard at the top. 5,000 only, 
come down the far side, stumbling, snow blind. At the bottom, a village called Jebdalik, another point where the path narrows. Um, the Gilzai erect this large holly hedge. And they get there about six in the evening the following day. Uh, just as sunset is coming, they can't see what's happening. The sepoys try to climb over the hedge. They get caught, another ambush. Uh, they're shot on the hedge. The tram cavalry trample the infantry. It's a complete mess. 300 only make it over the hedge. Uh, this is day four. And they are surrounded the following morning at the village of Gundamuk. Um, and uh, they've only got about 10 rounds each by this stage because they've had all their, artil their, their uh, stuff taken at the beginning. So they fire off an, uh, their volley or two. They do a couple of bayonet charges, but then the Afghans realize they've run out of, uh, out of ammunition, so they just pull back and shoot from a distance. One man survives. The guy has wrapped the, uh, the regimental colors around his chest, Thomas Souter, after whom the British camp in Helmand was named, Camp Souter. Ten cavalry, 14 cavalry, make it onto the gorgeous Nimla Gardens outside Jalalabad, built by Shah Jahan in better times, one of the staging posts for his summer expeditions from Delhi and Agra up into the hills of, Ka of, of Kabul. And amazingly, there's still gardeners there. There's, a, there's an endowment, a wax or something, which has been set up, so the gardeners are still there. The cavalry ride in. They haven't eaten for five days, and uh, so the, the Gardeners offer them naan and must. They get off their horses, eat their breakfast, and then they're clobbered to death by the gardeners with their spades. One man makes it through to Jalalabad. Dr. Bryden on his pony, and the pony dies on arrival. Um, among several survivors, though, Lady Sale, my great uncle Colin McKenzie, and many of the other officers are taken as hostage in order to swap for Dost Mohammed, who's in Ludhiana. And they describe the passage back in captivity. The Gil's eyes had now tasted blood and showed their tigerish nature, becoming very savage and fierce, um, demanding that we should be given up to them for sacrifice, brandishing their long blood-stained knives in our faces, telling us to look on heaps of carcasses around us as we should soon be among them. You came to Kabul for fruit, did you? How do you like it now, they cried. As we proceeded, we were met by large numbers of the enemy's horse and foot returned to Kabul, laden with, laden with plunder of all kinds. One miscreant had a little Indian girl sitting on the horse beside him. So for the British, this, of course, is their great defeat. But for the Afghans, this is, one, this is the great national myth, what, the, what uh, Bannockburn and uh, Robert the Bruce is for the Scots, what... Uh, Collins and the Easter Rising is for the Irish, what uh, Washington and Yorktown is for you guys, what Garibaldi and the Risorgimento is for the Italians, this is for the Afghans. Wazir Akbar Khan is now the name of the diplomatic area at the centre of Kabul. And this is a story which every Afghan knows. And wandering around, researching this in the villages and so on, uh, uh, in Kabul, everyone knew the names, like McNaughton and Burns, names long forgotten in India and Britain and everywhere else. This is an absolutely central narrative to Afghan nationalism. And for them, this is the great victory. This is the great uh, uh, defeat of the imperialists. It is said that 60,000 English troops, this is Mirza Atta again, half from Bengal, half from other provinces, without counting servants and camp followers, went to Afghanistan. But only a handful came back alive, wounded and destitute. The rest fell with neither grave nor shroud to cover them and lay scattered in that land like rotting donkeys. For the English love gold and money so much that they cannot stop themselves from laying their hands on any area productive of wealth. But what prize did they find in Afghanistan, except on the one hand the exhausting of their treasury, and on the other hand the disgracing of their armies? It is said that 40,000 English troops had been in Kabul. Many were taken captive en route. Others remained as cripples and beggars in Kabul, and the rest perished in the mountains like a ship sunk without trace. For it is no easy thing to invade and occupy the kingdom of Khorasan. These English had hoped to establish themselves in Afghanistan to block any Russian advance. But for all the treasure they expended, for all the lives they sacrificed, the only result was ruin and disgrace. 
if the English had been able to take and keep Afghanistan, would they have left this land where 44 different types of grapes grow? Another fruit as well. Apples, pomegranates, pears, rhubarb, mulberries, sweet watermelon, apricots and beeches, and ice water that cannot be found in all the plains of India. For these Indians know neither how to dress nor how to eat. God save me from the fire of their dal and their miserable japatis. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's Mirza Atta signing off on India. A word perhaps about, before I, we head on to the discussion, um, about um, when I started this book, th this is one of the most written about episodes in um, imperial history, but it, it's characteristically it's an, it's an episode which has been written about in English entirely from British sources. The reason of this is partly because there are such good British sources. If you go to the Inter office Library, there is every memo sent in frantic concern from Calcutta to London as this whole thing goes <coughs> down and the company share price plummets and the whole thing is a complete fiasco. Um, but also there's amazing private documentation. Much of it actually has only appeared in the last 15 or 20 years from attics and houses. Um, because the following year, the British send back another force, the Army of Retribution, when the spring comes and the pass is open. And this entire army has been covered in snow for the whole winter. And so when the Army of Retribution comes back, it's almost the week of the thaw. And this entire army is sitting there pristine, um, maybe with an eye or two pecked out, but otherwise pristine. And this army harvests the diaries and the letters. And so researching this book, sitting in the Inter Office Library, you call up something rather anodyne from the index, the diary of Ensign Stapleton, X3Z1 or something, and you call it up. Half an hour later, a packet arrives, and you go up to the desk and sign for it, and you open it up in the desk, and you find this thing. It's covered in blood. It's got a bayonet wound through it, and it's got some pathetic last letter from this chap saying to his loved ones, uh, Maud, I knew I'd never come home, you know, this sort of stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and you're sitting there in the Inter Office Library with all these other people sort of making grown-up calculations, and you're looking at this tragic letter, this sort of pathetic diary, which is literally, I mean, in several cases, literally uh, red with, with the guy's blood. Um, and this has been picked up. This has been harvested. So you have fantastic detail. But what I didn't realize until I went to Kabul was that, the, of course, this is a major event in Afghan history, and there's fantastic Afghan sources, too. Um, and we'll discuss more about this in the, in the, in the discussion. But the... Um, there is a fantastic array of Afghan sources for this, which characteristically have been used by Afghan historians endlessly, but never translated into English. So you have, as so often with imperial history in India, two totally parallel tracks of historiography. You have the English wallers, who include the post-colonial historians normally, who just use the English sources. And then you have the, the, a parallel track of either the Urdu and the Persian stuff, which never makes it, the two never seem to converge. And certainly in this case, there's a, there's a fantastic historiography um, these nationalist Afghan historians in the 1950s and 60s had a journal called Ariana, um, and they not only wrote learned articles about the various uh, factions and so on in the uprising, uh, they also reprinted the Afghan sources. And, and, and there's these lovely stories of, you know, some guy walks in from Ghazni and with a saddlebag is just found in a cave with half, the, half this incredible epic poem in it. One half disappeared, written on company paper, looted from the company, and they have this epic poem and diary, which they reprint in 1959, edition of Ariana. No one has ever translated into English or used it in any English source. So there's this rich, rich theme of historiography that I barely touch. The person who put me onto half of it, Ashraf Ghani, then the Chancellor of Kabul University, was able to, in half an hour, get down from his shelves in his house 10 major Afghan accounts. This epic poem. And what you learn from the Afghan accounts, of course, is that it's a very different picture to what the British are imagining. The British see a, a, a conspiracy. All the Afghans have been waiting for this. Suddenly, there's an uprising. From the Afghan point of view, this is totally spontaneous. No one had planned anything. And they're not acting in any coordination at all. The Gilzais are in one place. The pro Shah Shuja Sadizai faction are in, the, uh, in a particular garden. The uh, Dost Mohammed's men are in the old city. They're all, all got different aims, all got different objectives, and the different Afghan sources record these different aims and these different objectives very clearly. 
totally invisible to the British. Interesting, because you assume that the, the East India Company at this point at least has some handle on this stuff, because they all speak, a lot of them speak Persian, uh, some of them speak Pashtun, and they all speak Urdu. Um, you know, unlike the American forces and the British forces who went to Afghanistan largely ignorant this time, these guys at least have spent their life in that region and had the languages. They still are invisible, these, these things. And certainly that comes out in none of the British sources. So the Afghan sources give completely different sorts of information. It's particularly interesting of the, of the epic poems, for example, which are often recorded, um, often written within a year or two of this, and give a different sort of information. You know, it's full of, you know, 10,000 brave warriors came over the hill. So you don't actually expect the figures to be accurate, but they give very clear indications of Afghan ideas, ideals, um, uh, and, and their perspective on this. Uh, and so it's possible to bring these two rivers into Sangam, into uh, confluence, and, uh, and to weave them together, uh, and to create both sides. And, and what is lovely with a story like this, when you're trying to give narrative to it, is to be able to present real first-hand impressions from both sides, um, which often have completely conflicting perceptions of the conflict. Um, the other thing I wanted to do when I was in Afghanistan was to retrace the route. And in 2009, when I was, I thought you can't, I mean, you know, as a general rule, you can't write history without having known the area. Or, I mean, maybe number of people do, but it, 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 as a principle, you should not write history about an area you've never been to uh, and have no idea. Because it is always different when you see it on the ground. Um, and the problem I had was that in 2009, the, a lot of the route of the retreat was already back in Taliban territory because the, uh, the Gandamat, uh, where the last stand took place, the hill rising on the back, is none other than Tora Bora, scene of a more recent last stand. Uh, and this, of course, is, is kind of, you know, even in 2009, was central Taliban territory. But I had a very lucky break. Uh, I got introduced to a warlord called uh, Anwar Khan Jigdalit, who had just come in from the Taliban and was now the sports minister. Um, uh, and he had been offered this post in Karzai's government. He took me to his village, Jigdalit, which is where the Holly Hedge was erected. And so I got to see the Kod Kabul Pass and all this uh, territory. Um, and we had this very interesting uh, sort of narrow escape. I was trying to get to Gandamat. But when we got to Jigdalit, it was the first time uh, he'd been there for three or four months, and they did the Afghan thing. They built a fantastic lunches laid on, goats killed, fires built, apricot orchards, lovely Persian carpets, all that kind of stuff. And it went on for hours, as these things sometimes do. And I was sitting there sort of looking at my watch, saying, we've got to get on to Gundamat. And he said, you know, there's one more course coming. <laughs> and melons would appear. And, you know, but, and so it was about four o'clock by the time we finished lunch. And it was too late to go to Gundamat. Uh, he said he wouldn't take me there. It was going to be dark by the time we got there. So we went back on the on the rapid route to um, on the fast route to Sarobi and, and Jalalabad. Uh, to arrive in Jalalabad to find that thank God we hadn't gone to Gunbal because there'd been a replay of this that day. The army had gone to burn the poppies or to plow up the poppies, and um, the villagers had be previously had been promised compensation when their poppy was. Uh, uh, was plowed up, it had never arrived, some official had pocketed it on the way, and they promised that if it happened a second time, they would resist. So this time they resisted, they got the Taliban in, and they killed about nine policemen, took 90 hostages, blew up a couple of trucks. So when we arrived there, there was a major crisis. And the following day, Anwar Khan, my guide, was called as the, as the, as the local headsman of the next village to sort it out. So this jirga took place on the edge of Jalalabad. And they had this extraordinary morning where the elders came in from Jalalabad, these, these very distinguished old guys. Jigdalik met on behalf of the, uh, the mediator, the government was there. And it was just on this hillock next to the airfield in Jalalabad where the dr the, a lot of the drone campaign was run from. So these sinister drones were taking off every four or five minutes from the Jalalabad airport, silent planes. You never see in the movies, they, they make no noise, or you can't really hear them. And they, these things were circling above the Jirga as the two sides were discussing. And at the end, um, Anwar Khan introduced the elders to me, saying, These are, this is a great, the nephew of the guy you took, <laughs> you took hostage last time. <laughs> 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 and uh, I said, you know, 
do you see any, any parallels between then and now? And they all sort of fell about laughing. And they said, um, it's exactly the same. They said, <laughs> parallel. They said, they said, both times the foreigners have come there, come here for their own interests, not for ours. They say, we are your friends, we want to help, but they're lying. Whoever comes to Afghanistan, even now, they will face the fate of Burns and McNaughton. We are the roof of the world, said Anwar Khan to Zalik. From here you can control and watch everywhere. Afghanistan is like a crossroads for every nation that comes to power. But we do not have the strength to control our own destiny. Mm. Our fate is determined by our neighbours. And then one of them told a story. He said, last month some American officers called us to a hotel in Jalalabad for a meeting. One of them asked me, why do you hate us? And I replied, because you blow down our doors. This is the chief in reply. Because you blow down our doors, enter our houses, you pull our women by the hair, and you kick our children. We cannot accept it. We will fight back. And we will break your teeth. And when your teeth are broken, you will leave, just as the Russians and the British left before you. It's just a matter of time. What did he say to that, I asked? He, the American turned to his friend and said, if the old men are like this, what will the younger ones be like? <laughs> In truth, all the Americans here know their game is over, just their politicians who deny it. This, said Anwar Khan Dikdalik, is the last days of the Americans. Next, it will be China. Wow. Thank you. met at a reading of William Dalrymple's Last Mogul, and uh, just to give you a sense, when I say that it's an honor and pleasure to be talking about his work and putting this in, and while that's just a, rather, to some rather cliche to open talks like that or commentaries like that, uh, just to give you a sense of what I really mean. Uh, so at the time, I was a young, starry-eyed, hungry, lean and mean graduate student uh, who was so excited for the rest of the week that I got his signature. This gives you a sense of what an honor it is to now be sitting next to him and discuss him as next book. Now, because I want him to sign my copy of his new book, <laughs> my comments will be brief and exceedingly generous. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm joking about the generous part. It is easy to sing the many praises again of William Dalrymple's latest book. And my intention is to do so uh, for some of the but as well to talk about, uh, or offer some reflections on what it means to have read his book as a historian, fellow historian, and colleague uh, of Afghanistan. And so to begin with, before even talking about the plot, um, the argument, the many arguments that, he, that are indeed embedded in the text, um, 
by the way, those of you who decide to have me stop the story and uh, mid-sentence, that book is available uh, in the back of the room for, uh, I don't remember the price, for those of you who are, who are gripped by, uh, by personal and secret to follow up and purchase the book uh, after his death. You're welcome. <laughs> Ten percent. <laughs> so, to begin with, on style, writing style, I think this is something that uh, many historians, if we have an outline, he could be easy to give him uh, this introduction today. Uh, and those of you who have read the book or his other works will notice that the vivid description, the texture, the detail in the book is something that in it by itself is a story we'd like to spend uh, uh, much time on. Uh, William mentioned the 44 types of grace, for example, that he proceeds to describe in vivid detail. And just to give you a further uh, example, so just on trees, so this is William just on trees in Afghanistan at this time. William talks about apples, various types of trees. Apples, pomegranates, pears, rhubarb, mulberries, sweet watermelon, muskmelon, apricots, peaches, plums, weeping willows, poplar trees, vines, wild raspberry, and blackberry. In addition to uh, foliage, William, of course, describes in vivid detail the bustling bazaars of Kabul, the tranquility of Sufi shrines in Herat, and the, again, beautiful pomegranate orchards at Kandahar. He talks about the crystal lined snows of the high passes, the high altitude lakes of turquoise and jade, and of course the kebab and raisin halal uh, in the many segments that he enjoyed and described in the, in the introduction of the work, as well as took place among the characters in the book. All of this, all of this, all of these vivid descriptions are not just uh, uh, fancy tales, but they remind us that Afghanistan, even in describing a war, is a beautiful place, is a beautiful country. And those who have had the honor and pleasure of, tra of traveling to Afghanistan know exactly what I'm talking about, in that even the pictures and photographs we have don't suggest this is extreme uh, beauty and really a stunning natural beauty um, of the country. It is Kabul, after all, where the first Mughal emperor, Babur, uh, chose to settle and die, uh, though, of course, we have plenty of choices in that regard. William also reminds us that Kabul and much of Afghanistan at this time was at the crossroads of Iran, Central Asia, China, and India, and not an isolated or peripheral mountain kingdom. So that is something that's uh, very important to me and my own work, and I really appreciated that uh, the, the glimpses of uh, the central nature of Afghanistan, not in just its location on the map, but intellectually, artistically, uh, and there are many, many examples uh, uh, William describes throughout the book. Now, moving on to the research itself, uh, and this is where I can say, uh, if to many historians, I think I can speak uh, for many historians in the room now here, uh, uh, if we're not jealous about his writing style and his ability to create a very, very vivid imagery in his writing, it's the combination of that with uh, bread and butter, classic, historical, rigorous archival research that <coughs> William marshals in his book that makes it uh, quite a phenomenal feat and why he's a historian as much as a writer, as much as a poet. And uh, we were actually just discussing this morning just a quick anecdote. We happened to have studied and uh, done archival research at a lot of different places, including the Arshad al uh National Archives of Afghanistan in Kabul, an interesting place, as you might imagine. Uh, and as you walk in to the entrance of this old late Ottoman style building in downtown Kabul, there is an amazing uh, mosaic or photograph collage of all the directors of the Afghan National Archives. And it's a feat from present, uh, the vast majority of pictures are smooth, clean-shaven, suit-wearing gentlemen, followed by a photograph from the late 1990s uh, of a gentleman wearing a turban and uh, uh, long beard, and then proceeding again after 2001 uh, to uh, similar uh, aesthetic style of, of the directors. And so uh, this is the kind of place that uh, William has researched in, in addition to uh, national archives in India. Pakistan, Russia, and Britain. And this, which William was referring to at the end, this convergence of various streams, one of which would be a sufficient uh, book and by itself and worthy of much uh, academic praise. William brings together all these different uh, archives from different countries, uh, and that is something that is a story in it by itself. Now, to this, for the sake of brevity, I will not uh, rehash every single parallel that exists, and 
there are indeed many, uh, indeed many, not just between what many of us are thinking about in terms of first and last and war, uh, between Afghans and the British, but also uh, between Soviets and Afghans, uh, as well as, uh, of course, the, the current war. But uh, I will just mention some of them that were uh, expressed very astutely. And uh, we could say that, uh, well, before jumping into that, one more kind of broader uh, intellectual contribution on these books, and this is something I also really appreciate as a historian of Afghanistan, is that thanks to William's March Learn of Afghan Forces, the leaders of the, of whom as the Afghan resistance movement or resistances, and he was giving up a more fragmented uh, rather than homogenous group, the leaders of this movement come out as, quote, more rounded figures, human beings with full emotional life and with individual views and motivations, rather than just the usual hackneyed trope of bigots, fanatics, treacherous tribes. And instead, we get poets, we get scholars, we get lovers, we get men and women, though not enough women's voices. I think even women would agree, given the limitations of the book. Okay, now moving on to some of the historical perils mentioned the most prominent and obvious, uh, dealing with topography, economy, religious aspects of Afghan resistance, uh, the social fabric of uh, Afghanistan at the time, and the details of foreign local alliances. I won't get into all of those, but uh, just three many of those that I think were particularly uh, observant, beyond just the, the obvious uh, overwhelming force of the uh, first Indian army with its more ragtag leader. Uh, so beyond that, those obvious parallels is that William astutely describes how the problem here, if you want to say, uh, or the motivation or force behind some of these, those who take up arms against the uh, first Indian army, is not one of hatred of the West. It's not one of hatred of the West. Uh, but rather, when you look at, when you follow the storyline, the initial causes, if you want to say, are the rather mundane, mundane factors of rising food and land prices following the arrival of a massive imperial army and their supporting tax. Remember, I think William showed in his, uh, in, in, in his pictures that it's not just soldiers arriving, but tailors and scribes and doctors and nurses and a huge cast that when they arrive in a relatively not a huge cosmopolitan city like Istanbul or Cairo or Delhi, but Kabul, uh, you can imagine how the prices rise uh, as all the key um, localities are seized by this is something that there are loose parallels to the undeniable increase in property, uh, real estate prices following the 2010, uh, the beginning of the 2010 uh, U.S. First Strike War in Afghanistan, in which, as you might imagine, the arrival of not just soldiers, but UN development agencies and so forth. These are the kind of mundane things that impact uh, Afghans' everyday lives. Okay, so moving on. William describes the initial swift military victory. Initially swift and impressive and a stunning shock and awe victory, particularly following the capture of the Russian fort, followed by an, an uncontrollable, uncontrollable insurgency that gains momentum uh, after, again, rather mundane causes uh, snowballs into larger uh, uh, causes that again, again, that again get summarized as anti-imperial uh, Islamic jihad and so forth. Okay, ending, ending wars, and I'll close on this as a historical parallel. Uh, William talks about how, how did this war actually end, so to say? When did the, uh, the bullet finally stop firing? Is that this was not brought to an overwhelming military victory on either side, but through successful negotiations that um, began to uh, take place, even while the, the bullets were firing, but ultimately it was that process that brought the uh, conflict to a close. One missed similarity, I might say, uh, something that uh, I found, um, well, the picture's not up there again, but the portrait of the last stand of the 44th, uh, which, oh, there it is, thank you. Um, and, and then, of course, the, the portrait of remnants of an army of, of Dr. Dryden returning uh, uh, disheveled, which is always a lot of our portraits. I find that, and this is what I'm, I really want to kind of emphasize, is that French history is not just a study or a, a chronology of events, uh, or a study of what is similar and different in the past, but rather is a study, in a sense, of what we remember and what we forget about our past. And that is indeed is what the historical method is doing in that history. There's this parallel, you might say, between in spite of the imperial army's o 
overwhelming support, uh, at least upon arrival, uh, for the British to look upon themselves as underdogs, in a sense. And that comes out in this portrait. And I think part is why this incident of this tremendous defeat is so important, is that uh, it evokes notions of underdog, uh, of, of being a lesser power, of over surmounting overwhelming odds. Uh, which is something that we see in, in, in the history of Afghanistan throughout the many years we I require them to watch a film about Afghanistan and uh, the recent Hollywood Lone Survivor in which is a story about uh, a small regiment of Navy SEALs who again, uh, they themselves are uh, a small and underdog force facing uh, much larger uh, smaller <coughs> uh, groups but within a confines of, of the greatest military machine in the world. And so there's this common parallel of needing to define oneself as an underdog, as, as surmounting overwhelming odds that is driving both narratives. Um, the differences, I also want to say that uh, William, uh, as a good historian, acknowledges the many differences. The fact that there is no central unifying resistance leader uh, in uh, this story, uh, in, the, in, the, in the present, I would say. Uh, he identifies Mullah Omar as no Beis Muhammad or Wazir Akbar Khan. Uh, of course, all the tremendous changes that take place over the 20th century, um, the, the emergence of radical uh, Salafi jihadi ism, which is very different from historical Afghan Sufi influenced notions that we have, which of course uh, do, do not even signify militant struggle uh, by definition in the first place. Um, one, one more thing on the on differences is that uh, the first Anglo Afghan war rather than looking at the parallels, something that I would draw our attention to again is what is new? What is new about this conflict? And that is a, as important as drawing the parallels. And so it is this war that ushers in a new belligerent rhetoric into uh, Afghan resistance, the idea of jihad and the defense of Islam, uh, overthrowing a Muslim ruler, which is something that runs, that goes uh, against centuries of classical Sunni uh, jurisprudence in which Overthrowing a ruler is something that is seen as uh, far more dangerous uh, than the tyranny of a single ruler, and so forth. Um, this, the transformative role of new technologies, and we talked about that, uh, that this was a relatively more popular war that brought together tribes uh, across ethnic and linguistic divisions, as opposed to the more elite civil war of the medieval age. And just to close, Why do we study history at the end of the day? If history is not just a story of parallels and differences, are we studying history, Afghan history in particular, so that we'll be better able to rule or conquer it? If that is the intention, or if that is uh, the intended lesson of reading William Stubb, I think we will be disappointed. Because these are lessons that are, after all, uh, may find uh, maybe rather elusive, given that history is not just uh, a series of repeating uh, events, but is constantly made up of new, uh, of new developments. And if studying the aspect of the new and what is unprecedented, that after all is really important because it drives us to understand how, is change, how change is possible. If we just see parallels, then we'd be lost essentially in a, uh, the same story over and over and over. If we want to create progressive change, it's not possible. And so that is something that I would caution us with over reliance on looking for precedent. More importantly, history, as I mentioned, is not uh, the study of parallels and differences, but it's the study of what is remembered and what is forgotten. It is the study of our collective memory. It is a better way to understand ourselves, what we deem important and irrelevant. As William Jarvis will put himself, puts it himself, it is to see others as others see us. And so I'll read a quote uh, from uh, the text in which it's describing an army. Their armies, their armies were remarkable for their heartlessness, for their lack of any basic values of chivalry, and especially for their indifference to civilian casualties. And one more quote, for their rancor and spite, they will be burning houses and blazing walls, for such is how they show their strength, terrorizing those who dare to resist them, as is their custom, they will subjugate the people to 
that no one can make a claim to equality. These are words from Dost Muhammad to his son describing the British Army. In spite of the fact that uh, most expectations might lead us to believe these are uh, af uh, typical Afghan, treacherous and oppressive women of the USA, which is another quote used to describe the British at the time. And so in closing, why is the issue of terror love so important to us, I will ask, also ask, how did remembering of this war, what we forget, be it uh, the fact that this war actually brought together the conventional divide of tribes, of Sunnis and Sunnis, and even uh, religious divides of Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs, all of whom, uh, depending where you look, you will find them in alliance uh, against a common enemy on both sides. This and uh, I talked about the overemphasizing parallels, how the history, uh, the idea of history repeating itself, emphasizing that too much does it forestall or curb the possibility of productive change. And I'll cl I, I will close off with um, one final closer that on the issue of lineage and these, there are indeed tremendous parallels between uh, the descendants of uh, Sheikh Muhammad uh, leading to uh, his uh, tribe to leaders of the Taliban and then on the side of Dr. Shah to the final Karzai. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, thousand parallels of Proverbs, excuse me, in Dari and Tafsir. And it states, I would say, uh, reminds us of the danger of overly stressing lineage and again, in a way that might forestall possibility of productive change. And it goes like this. Once they gave the bar neighborhood, Islamic culture is like a fiat fee. When God most gracious gives, he does not ask who shall you be. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, you. Um, thank you so much to our um, wonderful speakers today. Um, Let's take some questions. Um, yes, Razira. Thank you very much. That was a very evocative talk, and I also appreciated very much Fez's questions. Um, why do we remember and forget um, parts of the past? One of the questions that came to my mind as you were narrating, William, was that um, it's Although uh, the uh, mo British mobilization into Afghanistan had all the possibilities of conversation with the land that they were entering, um, linguistic and potentially long experience with Afghan um, and Muslim cultures in North India, whatever. I mean, not, not that not that that would be uh, directly useful, but. But despite all the possibilities of uh, communication, yet the Afghan point of view remained remarkably invisible. And that's something that you uh, repeated, um, I think, at various points. Why did the Afghan point of view remain invisible? Um, and f following from that, a very small moment where <coughs> I, I struggled to understand was when you s described the cavalry coming down and the gardeners feeding the, this hungry uh, cavalry in Jalalabad and then killing them, right? And, and so uh, in a way, uh, that description didn't make sense to me. Um, and so in your uh, attempt to uh, tell a story from many points of view, uh, why do some gestures remain opaque to us? Why in the moment of battle, when there's all this possibility of communication, yet there is miscommunication? Um, So to, to answer the second one, the, the description of the, that breakfast is from Bryden, who's the, the only survivor. Um, and he was, he, was, he, was, he was, we don't have the Mali's view of what <laughs> happened. Um, but he, there is this feeling by the time they, uh, wait, for the minute they leave Kabul, that the whole countryside has risen up against them. 
uh, and there is there seems to be a remarkable unity in uh, uh, particularly in the um, once they enter the Gilzai territory down the Kurkabul Pass, Jigdalek, Gandamak, Jalalabad, uh, that uh, they have no friends on this. They are invaders, they are hated, and, they, and, they, and uh, everyone wants them out and wants them dead. And um, Br Brighton describes you know, all the, the local villagers, even, even when he, at the very end, just people just throwing stones at him as he's passing. Um, so I think, it is, I think it is just, you know, they, they, they were hated. And uh, and every, everyone wanted them dead. They, they were they, no one. They they had no friends in that part of Afghanistan. Um, the Afghan the, there are there is some good work done by the scholars in the army. 1839 to 1840, reading Burns's um, dispatches, which are in the National Archives in Delhi. Um, <coughs> You, there, I mean, there were an awful lot of people in the in the British force who spoke diaries, spoke Pashto. My own great uncle, whose who's voluminous records survive, was a fluent Pashto, a Pashtun speaker, a fluent diaries, fluent Hindustani. Uh, and you do get, I mean, there is there is a, a great deal of dialogue that goes on. It isn't that uh, everyone is at loggerheads. There are some very good reports done from. Uh, by the, the first Afghan war on the on the economy on the uh, and, and detailed detailed work. Also, very good uh, very good artists. Um, the earlier m many of the first images we have of the Afghan landscape: Rattray, Anderson. Um, these are still things that you see in Afghan houses, um, both in, in in Afghanistan and in the diaspora today. Uh, so it wasn't as if there was you know there was a bunch of complete bunch of fools walking in and getting everything wrong from day one. Um, there are some serious scholars among. Um, and um, but there is a there is a sensation that the communication breaks down from the minute that the uprising begins, and I haven't read a single British account that seems to understand these very central divisions in the besieging force, um, made more stark by the fact that they were in different camps. So the uh, the Sadazai, the pro Shah Shuja. Resist, uh, resistance who wanted to keep Shah Shuja but get rid of the British, who they believed were oppressing Shah Shuja and hadn't let him run his own country, were within the old city. In the Shah Bagh, you had the, uh, the Barakzais and the um, uh, Emir Dost Mohammed's supporters with Wazir Akbar Khan. Uh, and then the Gilzai were in a different end of town um, uh, uh, near, the, near the bridge. And, and they camped in different places, but the British don't seem to be aware of this at all. And I think from the minute that, the, in a sense, the siege began, they entered into a siege mentality. Um, and and uh, you get no, so they, I think that they didn't understand what was happening to them. So it would seem that despite having all this cultural and linguistic skills, um, knowledge, knowledge did not prevent um, this mess. This mess. Correct. So no amount of scholarship or scholarly understanding is going to necessarily, you know, give us an insight. Um, I don't think that's necessarily right. I mean, there were very, there, there were some very, you know, some very obvious and clear idiotic mistakes made by the British in the run-up to the thing, um, particularly by McNaughton, who was a, a fool um, and was recognised to be an idiot even before he got to Afghanistan. It, uh, there are these records of him as a high court judge, and everyone thinks, uh, says he should he should be restricted to minor cases, and then only ones that require written evidence or something. <laughs> His human skills were so. I did I did think you know one need to conclude that this that this was an inevitable ending for this story. Uh, but yeah. Uh, well, I would thank you both for for that great talk. And William, in the recent New York Review of Books, you have this wonderful article about aspects of Indian culture that have been exported and this kind of symbiosis that happens. And I wonder, after the, this British war, was there anything about Afghan culture that changed from this point of contact with British culture? I mean, was there any kind of cultural or uh, sociological change that after all of this happened? Well, in, in many ways, it created modern Afghanistan, uh, because Dust Muhammad comes back, and, um, and he by, and, and, and then the British support Dost Muhammad. They realise that he is that he is that, that they completely turn their, their uh, policy on its head, and 
as Burns had advocated from the beginning, they take the view that the Dust Mahomet is the best guarantee of British interest. Uh, and they arm him. And then that point, in a sense, is proven in 1857 when he, he keeps his agreement and doesn't help uh, the, uh, the uprising of 1857, although there's several envoys sent to him saying, cut this now, your moment, come down. Um, so by the end, when he, uh, in his final campaign, recaptures Herat in 1862 and dies in Herat and is buried in the Gaza Gun uh, of Herat. Um, he has created the shape of the modern Afghan state which we have today. So in a very real sense, uh, it, it, this in a kind of reverse, in, in its failure, defines the modern frontiers of Afghanistan. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree and I would add that the first Anglo-Afghan war really ushers in a series of transformations. That's what I was getting at. That there's a lot that's new about this conflict, and mm -hmm. also particular. And you could look at it as a nation-making moment, mm -hmm. in the sense or episode, because in the early modern and medieval age, you had what Thomas Barfield, a good uh, colleague at uh, Boston University, has a text on history of Afghanistan calls elite civil wars. Mm -hmm. In the medieval and early modern age, wars were more about kind of fratricidal competition between brothers or cousins and so forth, in which not much changed on the ground. It was kind of like corporate acquisitions and mergers, which come, one company buys another, but the situation on the ground, on the floor, is not changing. Maybe the, their tax from, I don't know, Ford to Toyota or something will change or something. But uh, this is a very different moment in which large numbers of Afghans across tribes and ethnicity take place. So it's, 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 it's a nation-making moment in that sense. But of course, uh, and, you know, William also shows there's still tremendous fragmentations, right, that uh, are embedded in the resistance, and there's a parallel there with the 1980s, and then we see the results of that in the 1990s, when it's essentially the resistance turns on itself and becomes a situation of civil war, so, uh, yeah. Yes, that was a wonderful talk, thank you so much. Uh, I was, since we were talking about parallels, I was wondering, and this is something that emerges fairly clearly in the accounts of Mount Stuart Elphinstone. And I was wondering if you could talk about the parallel between if we were to disaggregate the British colonial mission, or let's say the British mission into Afghanistan, and could we then draw a parallel between Afghanistan and Scotland in relation to British India and England? So if British India were England <coughs> to a lot of the British colonial mission or the people moving into Afghanistan, Afghanistan would appear to be Scotland. And there's this, there's this image that the frontier, the Hindu Kush and the Khyber were as if it were almost the Hadrian's Wall. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where civilization ends. And what would you reflect on that? So ma many of the Scots saw this parallel, and Elphinstone writes about it, and, and William Fraser writes about it. And, and so, but it is also, uh, there are many differences. And what's your friend who wrote The Making of Afghanistan? Ben Hopkins. Ben Hopkins has a whole chapter dedicated to why the Scots were wrong about this, <laughs> and why it's a completely different, uh, why in a sense they imposed um, their, their idea of Scottish clannishness onto Afghanistan and thereby misunderstood some important elements in the Afghan world. Um, and he makes, a, he makes a very convincing case that the kind of, uh, um, the vision of Scotland as promulgated by Sir Walter Scott um, which infused the writings of Elphinstone, uh, and he was full of Sir Ivanhoe and all this uh, and all this sort of stuff. Um, actually, is a very inappropriate model in some ways for understanding the, the very different tribal systems of Afghanistan. Uh, and he makes he makes a very convincing case. But certainly, it's something which every every Scot that's ever been to the Himalayas or Afghanistan, of course, recognizes. And, and we find ourselves in our own climate and, and, and smell smells we haven't smelt since we left home. And you find generations of Scots making this uh, immediate uh, 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 parallel and, uh, and, and understanding uh, and seeing in the Afghans uh, an echo of, of their own self-image. Uh, also, I mean, the, the British always had this very romantic idea of, um, you know, the noble Highlander and the noble Pashtun. Uh, these these uh, r romantic images of, uh, of uh, brave warriors, unbowed, uh, up in their mountains, uh, uh, yeah, the, the noble savage, as opposed to the treacherous folk of the of the plains. Oh, Kipling is full of this, um, uh, but uh, as I say, there's, a, there's an awful lot of Scott, Walter Scott at work, and uh, I don't think modern anthropologists buy it as, as much as uh, as they did. 
let's take a couple of questions together. Um, Lisa, Thank you, and then you are, um, The war changed both sides, and both sides learned. So from both of your perspective, what did the West learn when they keep going back into Afghanistan? Are they going back? with a better mission, with a better control on the perspective, or they still keep focusing on the same issues and that's what our disasters are because of? That's, that's, thank you. I'll take another question. Uh, if you can add your question, then take another yeah, Actually, I was going to make a comment and a question. Uh, the comment was, you know, I've been following William Radimpel's books for a number of years, and I really appreciate the non-Eurocentric perspective that you bring to historical research, because I think that's the core of the problem that the other lady also mentioned, is I think it's the hubris that is involved in the Eurocentricity of the world outlook that keeps people from really understanding or learning from their, from their past mistakes. So I think until the historical research turns to being world-centric, not Eurocentric, I think we'll continue to repeat the past and the, the Afghanistan you know, mistakes of the Europeans, the, the British, the Soviets, the Americans are, are going to be keeping on getting repeated. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We'll take those two questions and then we'll take another one at the end. So at the time, many people took the view that the British learned nothing <coughs> from the first Afghan war. When the second Afghan war breaks out, this was the, this was what, the wonderful letter written to the Times by one of the hostages and survivors of the retreat, George Lawrence, who was the elder brother of, of Henry Lawrence, who became famous in 1857. He wrote to the Times just before the British blundered into the Second Afghan War 30 years later. And this is a, a letter which could have been written in 2001. A new generation has arisen, which, instead of profiting from the solemn lessons of the past, is willing and eager to embroil us again in the affairs of this turbulent and unhappy country. Although military disasters may be avoided, an advance now, however successful from a military point of view, would not fail to turn out to be as politically useless. The disaster of the retreat from Kabul should stand forever as a warning to the statesmen of the future not to repeat the policies that bore such bitter fruits in 1839 to 42. <laughs> I guess just quickly, um, so the issue of parallels can come up in a lot of ways, and you don't even have to be a historian of Afghanistan, you just go back to many of us in our recent memory, uh, right after the uh, Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, and the sense of euphoria, you can imagine, uh, in a lot of places, perhaps more in the United States than in Afghanistan itself, you know, the experience of 10 years of war. But this was followed by a real diversion, and I think uh, you know, statesmen across the board, Democrats, realized that it was a huge mistake to divert attention towards, uh, or at least right. take, the, take the eye off Afghanistan. And that's just 1990. And, um, so essentially turn the eye towards Iraq um, and leave Afghanistan <coughs> towards this, cre creating a sense of abandonment that brought so many tro problems, as we now know. And then in 2003, uh, again, just 12, 13 years later, uh, at a time when there was tremendous, uh, I mean, to be fair, the U.S. British led invasion did lead to a sense of optimism, a sense of newness. Uh, you know, there was not this immediate insurgency that just came blowing out. It came up around 2005, 2006, after all this diversion towards uh, perhaps the most unpopular, biggest foreign U.S. foreign catastrophic state, okay. catastrophic in history possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, just 13 years later, uh, again Afghanistan towards Iraq. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but then again, I would go back to. There's also important differences, right, uh, that are important to, to, to really understand the situation and, and understand, well, uh, how can we better strategize? There is a role, there's no doubt, towards studying history. Um, I just, as a historian and not a policymaker, I maybe have the luxury to have the more broader observations as to what this teaches about us, right? How do we learn about ourselves? What do we learn about ourselves from reading these different chronicles and seeing different perspectives? Last question, I think. Thank you so much. Um, what a story. Um, and it's a story about many things, but the thing that struck me in terms of the parallels was uh, the way in which this army, your, your story of how they came, right, the things that they carried, uh, someone once said, uh, this huge set of, of commodities that they needed to have, that they felt they needed to have with them. 
and then thinking forward to our contemporary U.S. military in that same place with their 100-pound packs and their Bangladeshi truck drivers carrying carrying them the fuel that they need to run their air conditioners. And so that, that notion that there's a, there's a, a social history there of what what people, how people feel about their things and, and commodity culture, consumer culture, being something that's evident in an army. But as soon as I'm thinking of these parallels and wanting to hear what you think of that, I says, well, you know, what, what was unprecedented, though? What was different? Um, and encouraging us to think, and, and so that I would also ask you that. What, what do you feel was maybe unprecedented about more recent army and what it carried. I think there was a, um, a total separation this time. The, uh, the American troops and the, also the American civil uh, administration were not allowed to mix with Afghans. And so you get, you know, the, the, there was never any American troops wandering through Chicken Street uh, shopping for carpets in the bazaars or, 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 or sitting in the restaurants. And even when I was going in 2006, um, the, uh, uh, if you wanted to meet, if you had friends in the, in the American administration, or the, they, they had to sort of um, you know, skip off from school and pretend they were going to, meet, uh, you know, going to a meeting or something. Um, and none of them could get out of their compound after about six in the evening. They got, they got kind of locked up. So there was, in, the, in the British 1839 case, there's, there's strong friendships, and you know, many of the people that survived, survived because friends rescued them. Um, and um, also, I mean, uh, uh, many sexual relations. There were, uh, there were large numbers of mixed race kids born from this invasion. Some of whom go on in later history to play important roles, including um, uh, a whole variety of, uh, sort of famous stories out of this. Uh, so there were big differences socially. Um, and and the, so the, the Americans sitting in Bagram watching. Um, movies flown in and projected onto the side of the hangars, uh, eating Pizza Hut flown in at huge cost, never ever buying a single lettuce leaf or an egg from Afghanistan. Crazy stuff. Everything imported from Dubai or from, or from America. Um, and so, uh, uh, and, and therefore not benefiting the Afghan economy. You know, if, 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 if Afghans just been allowed to feed the troops in Bagram alone, that would have been a huge boost, but there's nothing. It all just flown in at huge cost. Well, there was some figure that it cost was it hundred thousand pounds a month or something, hundred thousand dollars a month to keep a single American soldier in Bagram. Um, it's kind of crazy, crazy. So they're very different in all sorts of ways, uh, humanly. Oh, well, I was just going to say, unprecedented. I would say, I mean, there are many differences, but the single biggest would be 9/11. There's no doubt. So obvious that we yeah. forget yeah. Uh, that. That I mean, it's also easy to forget at that time, those days after September. The outpouring of sympathy across the world, including countries like Iran and uh, you know many countries in the Middle East that issued some type of statement. You know, um, if I you know remember the debate with the, the Taliban and then later Pakistan itself about uh, you know what to do about this was not oh you deserve it but provided some proof or something or you know something of that nature that recognized that this was I mean just an unbelievable uh, shocking event. That could never be justified, uh, and 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 then in the run-up to war, that kind of got lost as it, you know, the country was invaded yeah. and so forth, and then it became this insurgency, uh, and it became very easy to radicalize, given that you had another, you know, the large, greatest military in the world uh, invading Afghanistan and all that. Those nuances were lost, and I would say possibly be lost opportunities, given I think things were more murky in that September fall of 2001 time before the kind of shock and awe invasion. Took well, um, it's, um, uh, it was very moving when Fez said that the whole point of history is uh, to turn to the past in order to make the future creative. Um, and it's uh, that well describes uh, not only William Dalrymple's um, uh, oeuvre, but the extremely generous lectures that he's given us during his visit to Brown, where he, with a subtle change of accent, with a, with a realigning of sources, uh, he just makes um, the world come into view uh, with um, a, a rich diversity, and that is a great gift. And for that, very many thanks. Thank you. Um, there's a reception. There's a reception outside. <laughs>